Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Miami Beat. Today we have two very, very special guests, and I want to introduce them to you right now. Lauren Regal, who is the, uh, the, the writer of this very famous book that is available <laughs> on Amazon, and Carlos Regal, cameraman, producer, uh, now retired from NBC that has traveled the world. This is going to be a very, very interesting show. So thank you for joining us. Lauren, I want to start with you. Well, start. Let, first, let me step back just a second. <laughs> I want to thank both of you for coming and dressed, coming in dressed in pink. Barbie pink. Because this is a Barbie pink, but it's also the messy pink. It is, and it's Miami Beat 305. And what's more Miami than messy, right? So now, we had to come wearing our pink. How fantastic is Messi? <laughs> what has Messi done for this community what, in your mind? I mean, tell us about that, <clears throat> Lauren, because I know you're a PR specialist, so you follow all of this. I do. I mean, I think from a <clears throat> communication standpoint, he's just elevated Miami. I think Beckham already elevated Miami. And then when Messi got here, I'm come on. I mean, restaurants changing their menus for him. Um, him people doing murals of him on the streets of Miami. I mean, this guy is making Miami his. And, um, and I think it's going to be great for for it's probably going to be an economic boom. If Taylor Swift can raise the economy of the United States, Messi can raise the economy of Miami. And he's done it almost instantly. Yeah. From the moment he stepped onto the field and won the first game for us. And uh, <clears throat> it's just been an ongoing situation for us. 100%. What does it do for the stadium, though? You tell me. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I haven't heard a thing about it. Really? I don't, yeah. I don't know if it's going to get built sooner, <clears throat> faster. I know they're playing in a very small stadium, they are. and I mean, like what, two or three thousand people? I'm not really sure how many uh, that stadium holds, but it certainly it's a small stadium. Thing is, when he steps, when the stadium is built in Miami, he's no longer playing for these guys. It's going to be five years from now, and that's a really bad thing. I mean, that's a downer. <coughs> that would be a real downer. Yeah. But, but you don't think he'll resign with? Uh... Well, he'll stay, but he won't play. I mean, yeah, he's 36 years old. Hey, 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 are you saying people who are 35 yes. are old? <laughs> yes. And, and, Excuse he, me. He, he's, he's the Michael Jordan <clears throat> of soccer. And at 36, he has to start thinking about, you know. We've just hit our prime at that age. Yeah, but not, not in sports, especially not in soccer. <laughs> I, I, I love this. I remember when he was playing in the World Cup, the guy, the announcers were talking about how he would time his, his uh, steps and he wouldn't waste any energy. When the guy's going to go past him, Messi had enough sense to go, let him go past me because he wanted to save energy to see if he can score a goal on the way, on the way back. So and that was a few years ago. So but talk, talk about the, the Olympics and the World Cup. You were in Brazil during that period of time. I went you, to Brazil. You were, the, for you were the cameraman for, for NBC yeah. during all those shots. Yeah. What was that like? Well, I, co I covered the news end of it, and I was with Natalie Morales, and we spent, like, uh, I don't know, two or three weeks doing... You know, following the players and all that stuff. It's great. Olympics, World Cup, Super Bowls. I've done a few of each. I think the most exciting one for the fans is the World Cup. The fans in the stands go nuts, man. They're, they're playing drums, they're singing, they're made up. It's just crazy. American football is crazy, but it's not like that. And the Olympics have regressed a little bit in the fan base. In other words, you go to some of the Olympics... Not because of COVID, but even you know before that, and it was hard to fill the stadiums. First of all, it costs a lot of money to get there. Mm -hmm. You know they're lengthy, um, so only the elite kind of go and follow the sport. And you know, you, and so they sit you down at the bottom. You buy a ticket. There's mostly a lot of empty seats. I mean, that's my experience with it. But, it but is, not in soccer. But it is one of the most amazing experiences when you Olympics go to an is Olympics. The coolest of it the, is I mean, the it's coolest. Amazing. I've had the honor to go to three of well two of them with my dad and um, the first one actually this is a really good story because this kind of gives you an insight into why our book came to be so I was I think two weeks old it was two weeks after I was born and my dad was heading to South Korea and went to the South Korea Olympics two weeks after I was born left my mom who's here on on set behind scenes with us um, left her with a newborn baby so since I was born my dad's kind of been exposing me to the world of media and the excitement that comes along with that and the Olympics are I just a huge part of it. I mean, you know, that's your job. You had to go. Yeah, I had to go. But this is a great segue, yes. Lauren, into your book. Of course. Talk about your book. What uh, prompted you to write this wonderful book? 
And where did this idea come from? Yeah, of course. So I was working crazy hours in New York City, um, 20 hour days in media. And I was like, you know what? I need a break. So I decided to, I resigned from my job and I decided to take a couple months off. And when I took a couple months off, I went into low income schools and I taught kids here in South Florida how to read English, um, kids who could only speak Spanish. And I volunteered for months. And I was like, you know what? I would love to write a children's book. And what would be better than, they always say, write what you know, right? So I was like, what would be better than writing a book about what I know, what I've known my entire life, which is growing up with my dad, being a photojournalist, all of his crazy experiences out in the world. And obviously we couldn't share crazy experiences with kids. So we had to like kidify the stories and PG 13, uh, PG the stories. Um, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to make the rhyme. We're going to do this. So started con conceptualized my idea, um, drafted. I don't draw. I am not an artist, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to draw what I think it's going to look like. And then brought an amazing artist on board and illustrated. Anne Marie Rapac, and she um, she took over and brought my vision to life, and that's where we came up with the Adventures of Lala and her Papa. Well, the Adventures of Lala and Papa. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I know I remember the day that you launched the book and you sent out a press release, and <laughs> I immediately went into Amazon and I bought the book. I said, "Wow, this is phenomenal, phenomenal!" Yeah. Because I have known you since you were a little kid, and I also want to share with the audience something else. You're not only a publicist, but you're also an actress. Uh. You have acted in, in <laughs> several movies in Hollywood. I did. Good so talk about that a little I bit. I was a child actor. Yeah. Um, that's kind of how I got my start. I knew I wanted to be in the media somehow, some way, right? So um, I started modeling when I was like five years old, and then my parents were like, I don't think this is for her. These people are kind of crazy. So we got out of that, went, became a regular kid, did regular kid stuff, and then I was like 13 years old, and we were like, oh, let's get her you know, back into the media. And I was like eating it all up. I was like, yes, I want to be an actress. Um, so I had a segment on NBC6 here um, on Sunday, Saturday, Sunday mornings? Saturday mornings. Teen Talk, and Teen my dad talk. and I did Teen that talk. together. Yes, and I got to like interview some amazing people um, in, in sync and we got to interview Debbie Allen and just really cool people that came through Miami and um, we got to feature them on the show so that dipped my feet into it and then we moved out to Los Angeles and I got to act in TV and film and I was on Medium and Weeds and did films that went to film festivals so it all kind of culminates into who I am today. How many movies did you appear in? Uh, a couple that went to film festivals and um, are released now on, you know, Amazon, Tubi, all of that kind of stuff. And then TV, TV shows and did guest appearances. I was um, actually got the honor to um, delve into and uh, into an autistic character. I played an autistic um, young woman on Medium with Patricia Arquette, which was an amazing <coughs> experience. I remember um, that movie. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was it was kind of like um, it was a really beautiful experience to be able to obviously I'm. I'm not, but to be able to understand um, what autistic kids and their parents go through. And I, that research that I was able to do uh, really did well with that role. So that was amazing. That's part of acting, right? And I, and I don't interrupt. I got to tell you, Hollywood gets a bad rap because, you know, young actors and, the, you know, the things they go through. But one of the coolest experiences in the world is being in Hollywood and watching your daughter make a, a movie. <laughs> it is the craziest, coolest thing to be on a set and she's being directed by, you know, Hollywood directors and cinematographers who are the top of their game. And so I defend Hollywood when it comes, because everyone's always giving them a bad rap. They're this and that and the drugs. And that. Believe me when I tell you, when you're on set, there's nothing but professionals working the craft, <laughs> and it is impressive, okay? And I, I'm not telling you something. I don't get impressed very easily, but you get impressed by Hollywood and the, and the way they go about making a movie. It's crazy cool. Well, you lived it. I mean, yeah. it was uh, firsthand. You were yeah. right there. You were on the set. You lived in yeah. uh, in Hollywood. Uh, for What were you out there for six, seven years? We were there almost 10 years. Almost 10 years. Yeah. Wow. And That's a long years. time. Yeah. yeah. A long time. And I thought I was a pretty good cameraman. <laughs> and when I get to Hollywood and I start meeting these guys, I was like, I've got to put up my game because these guys are fantastic. Every single one of them is an amazing cinematographer, editor, lighting directors. I mean, I'd go on set and I would be lighting my talent as an example, and I'm lighting her a certain way, and I'd have the lighting director come to me and go, can I help you? And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm looking at him, I go, okay, this is so-and-so the third. You know, and I go, I go, what do you think I should do? And he goes, well, this is what I would do. Very, I mean, 
cordial. And I said, okay. And he said, well, this is what you're, you want to bounce the light. You want to feed it off this, lower this. They actually would form a square box. This is the only thing you're showing on TV. They put a square box of foam to block all light coming out. And all that light that's being lost is now being bounced back into the face to uh, fill in all your imperfections, your, your wrinkles, all this stuff. And then you look at what they did and you go, oh, my God. I mean, what? <laughs> I've been doing it wrong for 30 years, you know. <laughs> that's that's Hollywood. And yeah. so it is, and it, it's just an amazing. They're, they are the best, to be honest with you. So I want to switch real quick. I yeah. want to talk about your photojournalist experience. Mm -hmm. Who is the most amazing person that you ever filmed, that you ever interviewed? <laughs> Lauren? <laughs> no, no. Besides Lauren. <laughs> well, I've interviewed, and it, just going back a little bit, Every or been in the presence of every president since Richard Nixon. Wow. Okay. So and you interviewed, you actually had Richard Nixon in yeah. front of your camera? We inter I interviewed Richard Nixon. Oh, I didn't interview, I shot the, uh, the You video, shot the, the camera. Of course. And mm -hmm. Barack was pretty cool. Uh, w was great. Mm -hmm. Trump, I've been in multiple press conferences with him. Um, there are certain guys who light up a room mm -hmm. when they walk in. Um, Barack Obama's one. His smile and his presence lights up a room. Fidel Castro lights up a room mm -hmm. like no one else, honestly. Right. Don't like the guy. I don't like him at all, but Nobody I have does. respect for his <laughs> presence. Um, Trump lights up a room. <clears throat> he just does. You know, there's something about these guys and their swagger, mm -hmm. you know, when they walk in. They take over the room. Um, w, George W. Bush was just, you know, very cowboyish. Mm -hmm. You know, he comes and he hits you in the shoulder. Hey, man, how you doing? You know, and you're like, <laughs> all right, Mr. President. You know, you just got smacked around by the, the most powerful guy in the world. Um, you know, athletes mm -hmm. and actors from Charlton Heston to Anne Margaret. Who's the most famous actor you ever filmed for uh, for an interview? I mean, uh, Sly Stallone, Charlton Heston, and Margaret. Um, did you ever do Madonna? No, but I did. Uh, I forget her name. The girl, uh, my wife loves. Her. Oh, not and not Barbara Streisand. The other, uh, what's her name? Um, well, in, I, in Vegas, we interviewed every other week. We're in Vegas doing interviews when I li lived in California. <clears throat> yeah, because so we're close. Every, everybody, everybody, yeah. Jennifer Aniston, you know, mm -hmm. all of them. It was just like uh, at some point you go like, okay, whatever. Just, at that point, when you were in uh, in Las Vegas, you were part of the network team, correct? I mean, yeah, were, NBC News. shooting for NBC News. NBC News. shooting for the Today Show. and uh, Today Show with uh, Nightly News, Lester Hall, Jose diaz Ballard. When you work for NBC, NBC is a huge, huge company. And when you work for these guys, you not only cover news, but you cover sports. You cover Today Show, Nightly News. You cover, uh, a spec they also have cable shows that mm -hmm. are... Um, you know, uh, from Bravo to all this, so you cover all that spectrum of stuff. So you can get called to do anything from a documentary to a behind the scenes to a spot news in Chile for the miners mm -hmm. at the drop of a hat. You have, when you're a cinematographer or a photojournalist for the networks, you have no life except the network life, to be honest with you. you I managed to, you know, kind of have this life also a little bit mm -hmm. with my daughter and wife and stuff, but the reality is that when they call, you have to go. No you're matter like what doctor. you're doing. You're a doctor. You're always on call. Yeah. No, no, it's worse than a doctor. Yeah. It's worse than a doctor. Because the doctor only has to go. Seven, yeah. The doctor goes to the hospital. i got to get on a plane and go halfway around the world in a drop of a hat. And so you've got to be ready for that. You can't, you know, you can't be cocktailing. You can't go out at, uh, although I did cocktail, but you, <laughs> you, you take your chances. But you can't go out. You get called in the middle of a wedding. Not, you know. Something there's, you can always, hey, look, I'm not going to work this day, but that's not the norm. I remember calling you one time, and uh, because uh, we had a very, very interesting uh, press conference coming up, and you answered the phone, and you were in Guatemala. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm like, what are you doing in Guatemala? I just, I just uh -huh. saw you yesterday here in Miami. But that's the life that a photojournalist for a network station like that. And, uh, and I got to tell you, it is spectacular life. It really was. I had a friend of mine who gave me a, uh, said to me once, he goes, if you want to do adventurous things, you have to live, you know, an adventurous life. You can't, you know, want this and not be able to go after it, you know. So you have to, you know, accept what your fate is on that scene and, and go and chase it. And and it's pretty cool. I'm sure you know, it I, is. I'm now finished that, that time in my life that, you know, but... 
Um, and I don't miss it now that I'm retired. I don't miss shooting the camera, I'll be honest with you, because there's so many memories that when I get a little bit like, oh, you know, I just think of something I did and go, okay. You can't, you can't duplicate that, you know, because you only can do things at a certain time in your life. At 30, I couldn't do things that I'm doing now than when I was doing at 30. I'm sure. And you can't run around a, uh, yeah. a riot or, a, you know, a revolution at 63. Or a war. It, you, you're just not going to do it, man. Yeah. I mean, I, you know. You're in the middle. You've been in the middle of wars and well, civil unrest and all. Yes. So a, lot, a lot of, a lot of the wars, had, co combat photographers are a special breed. Mm -hmm. uh, I never mm -hmm. really did combat that, you know, like Syrian wars and stuff like that. That, I didn't want to do that because I thought it was a, a little bit too dangerous mm -hmm. for my liking. Because, you, you know, you, those are bombs and stuff. I just don't have the appetite for that. But revolutions and, and, and riots and stuff like that and covering more than 80 hurricanes, you know. Well. Traveled about 60, 70 countries, so. Amazing. It's been a cool life, yes, sir. Now, I want to segue back over to Lauren, because yes. we're here to talk about this wonderful book, Lauren. Yes, we so are. I want everybody to know, <laughs> what, your, what was your life like growing up with this, uh, this, this type of lifestyle, where all of a sudden, one, one minute, your dad is sitting next to you at the dinner table. Next minute, he got his camera on his shoulder yep. and his bag, and he's running out to the airport. What was that like? A thousand percent. So I think I was the only child who was, like, four years old or five years old in, like, kindergarten and would, like, talk to kids about the news. And I think their parents were probably True. like, la, 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 don't tell them about things that are happening. Our kids aren't allowed to watch TV. They're not allowed to watch the news. And I was like, I knew everything that was happening. Um so growing up in that lifestyle was definitely unique um, and it gave me a unique perspective on the world and on life and you know you go to bed and then wake up and dad's in you know Alaska or you know he got called in the middle of the night and he's at the volcano in Iceland and you're just like oh wait what just happened like um, so it gives you I wouldn't wake her up no but I give her a kiss if you <laughs> It's a lot of flexibility, right? You have to become very flexible. So you grow up in a world where things are constantly changing and moving and shaking. And um, I don't work at that pace. It's not my personal, like, I don't think I could function like that. Um, but he definitely does. And so I was just kind of, you just mold your, your life around that. So a lot of those adventures are, are in our book. And that's, you know, that's... You have a master's in communication now. I do, I do. And uh, is that what... All this experience of growing up with your photojournalist, famous photojournalist's <laughs> father, is that what prompted you to write this book and get into media and get your master's degree in, in communications? It is. It is. I never really knew anything else in my life, right? My whole life was based around media, communications, mass media. Um, what sells, what doesn't. And so I, it was kind of my world. I really don't know anything else. And I think my time in Hollywood also helped me with that, right? So I public speaking and understanding how, how people connect to one another and listening to people. I think that's always the most important thing. You can hear people and that doesn't really resonate. But when you really listen to people, that's what resonates with humans, right? Um, and that's one of the most important aspects of communication. So all of those little things are in this book, um, except the book rhymes from front to back. So I I don't know. My, my uh, professors would probably be like, oh, goodness, you know, she, she rhymes. Some of the words don't even make sense because they're for <laughs> kids. So um, but but that was that is part of who I am as a person and why I went back to school, um, decided to get my master's in communication and, and keep pursuing um, just helping people and giving people information that they so want. Right. We're in this technology age and in this information age where everything we're consuming from entertainment to social media to news, everything. Everything is information, and people just crave it, and they want real information, not fake information, but, you know, it happens. Um, so how do you control it? How do you help people know what's happening around them? And that is mass media and communications, and so that's where I found my niche. Talk about how the world has changed since you started in media when you were a young girl, uh -huh. and you started with, with a show at, at NBC6 here in Miami. How has it changed your career with this, now this digital me new, news media where everything has gone digital and everything is like at the snap of a finger where everything, how has that, has your career changed? How has your mindset changed as to 
what you want to do, uh, pursue your career for the rest of your life? Yeah, I think that part of my, the big one of the biggest parts of who I am as a person has been adapting. One of my first managers that I had um, used to call me a chameleon. He's like, you're my little chameleon. You can transform <laughs> and become like all these different characters. And you can, because you, you feel what other people are feeling, right? My therapist would call it the fact that I'm an empath, but, uh, but it's kind of like you feel what other people are feeling and you kind of resonate with them and you understand them. That's it. That's all it is. And then being able to use those techniques of adapting to different situations and figuring out the communication is changing and I want to change with that communication. So as digital communication, social media came into play, like I wanted to adapt with that. So I started taking those things under my wing and, um, and you know, I use that as part of my communications repertoire is social media managing, doing all these different aspects of media because when it comes down to it it's all information that's all it is sharing information and communicating with people i i, I want to change the subject a little bit because yeah, there's a there's a there's an article i read yesterday in the washington post uh where this artificial intelligence mode of communication and you know prepping for articles and things like that are basically diminishing the role of females in the in the media world how do you see that? Because they're saying that by the year 2030, uh, it, it's, it, females are going to be it's going to be a small part of what the media world is like. How, how do you see that? So, I mean, this is the thing. I think AI is a um, very complicated <laughs> topic to get into. Um, but the one thing that AI doesn't bring in, which I think people I haven't heard one person probably mention yet is personality. I don't I don't know like I can't sit with AI and have this amazing conversation that we're having right now and I can't connect to AI in that way and I can't marry AI and I can't date AI. I mean maybe somebody can. I don't know. Tell me, call me, uh, mom bumble, <laughs> I don't know. Um but it's hard to find that, right? It's hard to find that connection. And so I think that is maybe where we're going to delve into it and I think it's going to have amazing success with medicine and it's probably going to be able to help a lot of people as well. Um and we'll find a balance. I think we will. I think we'll be able to use it for the best that it has to offer. And at the same time, we will remember that we need, you know, some people like us and some females. And we need these personalities to come out and help out. What I find that is really amazing is, is that AI has been in the works now for years. But all of a sudden, just in the past six, seven months, AI has come to the forefront of all the media. Everybody's talking about AI now. And it really, truly has impacted everything that we do on a daily basis. I, I find articles about AI and stories about AI in just about every medium that I, that I pick up, whether it's digital media, whether it's uh, print media. A AI is like the talk of the town right now. Mm -hmm. And had AI been around, uh, Mr. Photojournalist, <laughs> and Mr. Regal, had AI been around when you were a photojournalist, how would that have impacted your I don't even career? understand what AI means. I, I just don't know how it impacts me. Mm -hmm. I, I know there's a million different ways. I just haven't delved into it to understand it. I tell you, the thing that's impacted probably photojournalism is the fact that everyone now is a photojournalist. And so you don't necessarily have to get on a plane and go to whatever, Argentina for some sort of revolution to shoot it because somebody with a phone is shooting it for you. So a... a, a reporter still needs to kind of go, but they can get out there and not need a uh, photographer. They can go with their phone. So there's more of us. I don't know if there's more of us who are, who are, you know, trying to make it as a career, but the images are being captured. So if that's what AI is doing, artificial intelligence is just everywhere around you, it's enhanced how you get your news because I can tell you if it takes me a day to get somewhere and somebody's already there, they're going to get better pictures. Wow. Maybe not the quality of pictures, but there's 50 phones with, you know, they're going to get all the angles. So I get it. Um, so a photojournalist in today's world is probably limited to what he's going to do, unless he's really, a, you know, super great yeah. photojournalist. He's out there, you know, natural geographic kind of thing and shooting all kinds of cool stuff. But so there's limited. I think they're limiting, you know, our, our craft. So I probably left at a good time. So I'd be <laughs> disappointed if I was about to get on a plane and go, don't worry about it. We got a guy with a phone. <laughs> I'm like, really? You know, I, I wouldn't be very happy about that. I'm sure you would be. Let me go back to Lauren real quick because uh, there's, there's, some, there's some segments in your book that are really, really interesting. 
I would like for you to talk about which is the one segment in the book, and I see you flipping through the book. I know, I, I, through, I, I, through I, can't, I can't help myself but, yeah, but flip through the pages. But, and just but I see that you're, you're, you're looking for, for a particular page. Which is the one area in that book that you feel is the most important in terms of how you grew up with this very famous photojournalist as a father? You know, I, I look through it, and I, every story means something to us, you know? So I think that, yeah, this page is actually really great. Um, I'll, I'll read this. She goes, Lala fumbles, stumbles, and tumbles to give him a huggles, and he just chuckles, because that's just the way this cookie crumbles. So there's just something about, like, always waiting for my dad to come home, and he would always bring me treats, and that's in the book, right? He, would, we, he went to, like, England, and he'd bring me tea, or he'd go to South America and bring me jewelry. There was always something, or even a chocolate, right? There was always something waiting for me when he came home. So I think that those memories, they, they carry a lot of weight in our family, so. Yeah. I brought even shoes from <laughs> Brazil. Yes, I'd walk in because I, I'm, I'm a girly man in the, in the business. I was known as when the, all the female reporters wanted to go shopping. I would jump in and go shopping with them. They're like, really? I go, yeah. So they go like, what do you? I go, where are you guys going shopping for shoes? I'd go with them, and I'd get Lauren and my wife shoes. And they would go like, Jesus Christ, we can't believe this guy. I go, so I come home and I go, I got you shoes from Brazil. And they're like. <laughs> Really? Yeah, so that's... Yeah, he would always come home with something. So that was that's an exciting part, and I love that part of this book, you know, that we kind of integrate that that part of our life um, in here. So so that's a special moment. I remember ordering the book, and I remember... I couldn't wait for it to arrive because I, re I read the press release, and I said, wow, this is got to be really interesting. But knowing you since you were a little girl and knowing Carlos since for, for years now as a professional photojournalist, it was so interesting to receive it actually... Open, open the package, take the book, and actually flip through it and read it. It just, it actually touched my heart. I thought it was a very, very uh, heartwarming I'll tell you uh, story. Something really interesting. When when I would come home, the first thing, especially when she got a little older, she write. She said, "So how was your trip?" And I go, "Okay." With it. And she would write down what, you know, I would tell her. I go, "Okay, well, I went to, you know, Iceland. I was over these volcanoes, and the, you know the." The volcano's exploding, and we're flying over it, and the, the ice was the size of school buses going by our helicopter, and I'm seeing her writing down. And all that came to fruition when she wrote the book. She had all these notes for years. So, you know, because I would forget. I mean, and she goes, hey, I'm ready because I got, you know, tons of information. So it was an easier write, I think a little easier to write it when you have... You know, something to fall back on as opposed to trying to rethink the process and go, oh, did I, what and did we, I do that day? We have the original manuscript with like stick figures because obviously I, these characters were created by our amazing illustrator, uh, not by me. Um, but the, the original manuscript is fantastic and you see all the little stick figures with the stick figure right. hands. And so you're like, oh, this is just so good. This is so, I'll have to show it to you one day. Yeah, yeah, that's what I look forward to seeing. <laughs> What's next for, uh, the famous photojournalist Carlos Regal. I'm, I'm, what are you doing? I retired, and I we are moving to South Carolina. Huh? We bought a home up there, and um, boating, golfing, and I, I don't look at the news too often. Honestly, <laughs> I don't look at. I mean, I and I don't say that in a, in a bad way because I think Lester is a genuine cool cat, but mm -hmm. um, I'm very critical. And so I was, the first thing I do is like, oh my God, who's shooting this? Like, <laughs> uh, it just drives me nuts. So I can't do it. And frankly, I just, you know, my wife is a big night leaf. So I am forced to watch a few minutes with it, but I really doze off. I do, I'm there just for, out of respect. But um, that's about it. Just chilling, man. I, I need out a break, you know? So I think it's kind of cool. And you know, not me. I love it. I'm all about it. I'll watch the news. <laughs> yes. I'll read Twitter. I'll be on Threads. All of it. Contact me. I'm all about it. Yes. I'm all in. Yes. <laughs> Contact me. I'll give you her number. <laughs> <laughs> and that was what I wanted to segue to you, Lord. What, what's what's uh, what, what's uh, next for Lauren? I got some secret stuff happening right now. You know, okay. I got some stuff in the pot, and um, I hope. I'll, it'll come out on social media very soon. Um, but but yeah, no, I, I mean, I would love to eventually maybe write another book. So we'll see we'll see how that goes. Maybe we'll write an Adventures of Lala. That's book. the last thirty seconds. That'll be good. Uh, please go on Amazon and buy the book. The uh, yes, the Adventures of Lala. The Adventures and her of Lala papa. and her papa. It's a, it's a great book. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here. We'll be back next Friday at 1 p.m. Join us, Miami Beat, with some phenomenal guests. Thank you very much.